Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a pleasure uh, for me to be here. And uh, it is, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. And it is, you know, an uncanny coincidence that I'm talking of the fugue as a paradigm for uh, literary creation here in Leipzig, which is the city, I mean, Bach city, the city where Johann Sebastian Bach moved and uh, spent the rest of, it, of, his, of his life. And it is, however, not for the sake of paradox that I decided to juxtapose Henry James's masterpiece, The Portrait of a Lady, first published in <clears throat> 1881. Uh, to a fugue, nor is it because I detect uh, uh, in the story of Isabel Archer, the protagonist of the novel, any reference to Baroque music. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that the novel itself functions as a fugue, uh, presenting what uh, Caroline, Caroline Levine would define the affordances, that is the potential uses or <clears throat> uh, actions latent in the fugue. This paper does wants to pose a twofold question. Uh, uh, besides reflecting whether and to what degree the portrait of a lady is comparable to a fugue in strictly uh, structural terms, it will investigate those external, that is extra formal, extra textual solicitations that have prompted a novel in the form of a fugue as the most suitable and adequate answer. So, the fugue. One of the distinctive expressions of Baroque music the fugue represents the most complete and refined systematization of polyphony, whose origins date back at least to the 15th century. In its formal features, it is based on the principle of imitation. There are several voices, each exposing the same theme in sequence after the theme, which is called subject, uh, uh, is exposed by the first voice, the second enters and repeats it, transposed to another key, and so on. The previous voice, meanwhile, exposes the counter subject and but the use of different keys and the opposition between multiple voices allowed the author to fully explore the thematic and harmonic potential of the subject. As the composition approaches the end, the distance between the voices shrinks, as if they were hastening towards a conclusion that, far from being a final synthesis, merely states the impossibility to proceed further on. Uh, the few does, does not dialectically oppose contrasting themes, but obsessively repeats the same subject, every time displays and exposed in a different key and melodic arrangement. Any possible opposition played out in the fugue remains unsolved until the end. As I just remarked, the fugue is associated with Baroque <clears throat> music even by those who are hardly knowledgeable about the history of Western music. And in order to make sense of the very idea of Baroque, I will refer to another important figure linked to Leipzig, Gottfried Leib Leibniz, whose thought I will refer to through Gilles Deleuze's reading. In his 1988 uh, default, Leibniz and the Baroque, Deleuze identified Leibniz as the Baroque philosophy par excellence. My hypothesis thus moves from the assumption that the portrait of a lady, in order to exhaust its, its potential as a Baroque slash Leibnizian novel, could not be constructed but according to the formal and structural principles of the fugue. Assuming that a fugue could function as the musical equivalent of Baroque philosophy, my contention is that in writing the portrait of a lady as a fugue, Harry James has filled a microscopic gap in the history of American literature, providing it with a Baroque novel. In the portrait of a lady, the fugue functions, to use Levine words, Levine's words again, as the structuring principle of the bounded all of the narrative and, its, and of its more or less implicit extra textual references. In line with the tenets of modal logic, which had in Leibniz one of its most prominent forefathers, the fugue is the best of all possible forms for the narrative and ideological matter that James deals with in the portrait of a lady. Like a fugue, in fact, the portrait of a lady is made up of several motifs and several figures that recur over and over as the story goes on. Uh, there is no final goal since, since the novel's ending is open. Uh, we do not know what its protagonist, <coughs> Isabel Archer, will do once she's back in Rome. And above all, we do not know why she finally realizes that it is to Rome that she wants to head back. Nor can we trace any progression in Isabel's story, any linear trajectory that brings her from a presumably obscure or undefined origin to any final accomplishment. Quite the opposite. The novel could be read as a continuous overlapping of characters, settings, motives, and episodes, often harking back to each other. Uh, when we think 
<clears throat> that Isabel's life has finally gone through a turning point. She got married to Gilbert Osman, this event representing a clear-cut divide in her existence. Another story, reminiscent of hers, begins anew, featuring her 15-year-old stepdaughter, Pansy, as a protagonist. Pansy's stories, story occasionally replicates episodes and intellectual and emotional states that are comparable to the ones Isabel experienced in the past, despite the protagonist's role, roles <clears throat> having been utterly displaced. In a painstaking conclusion, the last chapters go back to Garden Court, where everything began, but at a considerably higher speed due to the tragic motive that underlines the novel sending, the death of Ralph, Isabel's beloved cousin. Whoever has an even superficial familiarity with the novel should not have any difficulty in, detective, in detecting, sorry, even in this cursory description, a striking similarity with a fugue. There is one more reason why I'm thinking of the portrait of a lady as a fugue in purely formal terms. Uh, uh, in, in the fugue, each theme does not necessarily have any aesthetic value per se. As the 16th <coughs> sorry, century uh, treatises remark, the themes of the fugue had to be kept short, clear, and essential for the sake of the mechanism of imitation. The value thus derives not so much from their intrinsic beauty or refinedness as from the position they occupy in the structure of the composition and the way in which they overlap or contrast with other themes. It is a matter of combination and vertical assemblage rather than of melodic autonomy and sophistication of the subject. Likewise, the portrait of a lady functions as a topological novel or a novel about topology in so far as its character's identity and personality derive from the position within the network of relationships established among them through a progressive emptying of any positive identification and definition or the, of their selves. So the Baroque, like the subject of a fugue, Isabel's self is fragmented to, constantly displaced, opened up, and progressively undone. This process of unfolding does not only derive from the narrator's psychological insight, but rather functions as a more radical questioning of the individual as an autonomous and well-balanced organism exerting its full control over the world outside. This is the trait that allows me to associate James' narrative with a fault that Deleuze identifies as the, the essence sorry, of Leibniz's Baroque philosophy. The monads that make up our material and psychic universes, Deleuze argues, uh, by constantly unfolding, replicating, and approximating to each other, bring to the surface the obscurity that lies at the bottom of each of them. This process of unfolding and imitating disrupts the squared and clear-cut geometries of 16th century Rinascimento and its linear and rational repartition is in res cogitans and res extensa that lies at the core of Descartes' thought. According to Leibniz via Deleuze, the monad is obscure and has no doors nor windows. Being obscure, it can express the entire world, but obscurely and dimly because it is finite and the world is infinite. And for this reason, it needs to expand towards a clear and distinct zone of expression. The tension between finiteness and infiniteness accounts for the effort of any single element of the finite world to expand towards the infinite. The infinite, at the same time, is reduced to the vague perception that each monad has of the world, figured out in a sequence of singular images that follow each other and acquire a tentative coherence as the monad unfolds, like discrete snapshots illuminated by intermittent flashes of light. The opposition between light and dark recurs in a number of episodes in The Portrait of a Lady. Uh, let me linger a bit on chapter 42, in which Isabel reflects on what is happening to her life <clears throat> after her marriage to Osmond. The two terms, light and dark, rather than opposite polarities, stand for the swaying limits of the same process, that of Isabel gradually acquiring awareness of her condition. Isolated in what she calls the house of darkness, Isabel realizes that she had taken all the first steps in the purest confidence, and then she had suddenly found the infinite vista of a multiplied life to be a dark, narrow alley with that <clears throat> wall at the end. What is going on outside the house of darkness? Isabel finally understands that until now she has imagined a world of things that have no substance, 
as if her final and for most readers disappointing choice to marry Osmond had allowed her to realize that rather than experiencing reality, she had spent her life peeping into the outside world from a remote and dark recess, only catching pale shadows. The acceptance of marriage as her only possible choice, the best of all possible worlds, takes up and at the same time counterbalances her pristine desire for freedom, she has married Osmond because marriage was the only option that still left her free to figure out what her life would have been were it not what it actually was. The other characters of the novel thus turn into projections of alternative existential <clears throat> choices, the other possible worlds that she could have inhabited and as she chosen the zero degree of existence that is her marriage, uh, 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 which is epitomized by the house of darkness she shares with Osmond. The latter, after the first year of marriage, deliberately, almost malignantly, had put the lights out one by one, leaving her surrounded with shadows that get darker and darker. These shadows, the novel goes on, were not an emanation from her own mind. They were a part of her husband's very presence. Uh, I do not want to point out how close the novel uh, gets to the less suggestive description of Leibniz's monads. I want to rather remark that this passage could be read as the moment in which Isabel realizes the imperceptible and monadic nature of her world and, on a, and of her very self as she's gradually absorbed in the darkness. Uh, let me go back to the few which, which is, after all, the leitmotif of this reading of The Portrait of a Lady. Uh, where does the shift between Isabel as the monad to Isabel as the subject of a fugue occur? It is the list again that will help me bridge the gap between two, uh, uh, these two only apparently distant perspectives. The list opens, yes, <clears throat> his uh, uh, chapter about Leibniz, the monads, and the body with a suggestive, albeit not immediately understandable statement, I must have a body because an obscure object lives in me, and then explains. Why can't we get along without bodies? Leibniz often says that if bodies did not exist outside of perception, the only receiving substances would be either human or angelic, to the detriment of the variety and of the animality of the universe. The form of the fugue is what provides Isabel with the animality that she needs in order to escape from, the, from <clears throat> her house of darkness. This animality actually mounts to her unfolding into numberless selves though her substance is left unchanged. The principle of imitation being the essence of the fugue and at the same time its tragic limit seems to be operating in the construction of Isabel as well. She can only turn into different simulacra thanks to the structure of the novel that, as in the fugue, requires her to constantly change. At the same time, she's condemned to the immobility of only being herself until the end of the novel. After her marriage to Osmond, Isabel undergoes a self-annihilating transformation, the tension towards freedom that had animated the years before the marriage now being replaced by her slow adjustment to the, the archetypal figure of the devoted wife. As a monad, she's motionless and only able to figure out the world that she dimly detects from the house of darkness where she is confined. Uh, yet her attraction to the clear and distinct zone of expression amounts to the transition she has perpetually gone through since the very beginning of the novel, from one continent to another, from one suitor to another, from one role to another. And after the marriage, she becomes Osman's wife or uh, a pansy stepmother, functions that much as radically distant from her past aspirations and irreconcilable with what she used to be, nonetheless do not alter her condition of solitude and isolation. The events that occur after her marriage, moreover, seem to be mere replicas of past events, as if each character had simply moved over, hardly altering the underlying structure of the novel. Lord Warburton, the English gentleman who had fallen in love with Isabel at a very rival in England and whose proposal she rejected, declares now to be in love with Pansy. The latter has, just, has thus taken over the role that Isabel previously had. Isabel, in turn, has somehow replaced her aunt Lydia, other characters like Madame Merle, and so on. So the tension towards a clear zone of representation, the corporeal animal life, 
uh, of the many monads that stir, that keep stirring in the novel is arranged according to the narrative paths of replica and imitation. Not only do the protagonists repeat what other characters have done before, their variable and progressive identification depend on the role and the position that they occupy. In a few, the subjects chase each other, reproduce the same melodic pattern every time in a different tune, and cannot achieve nor uh, do they mean to achieve any other conclusion they're exploring the infinite potentials of the harmonic and melodic combinations that the fugue allows them to explore. In the portrait of a lady, similarly, each character only wants to expand his or her perspective over the world outside, perpetually swinging between opposite polarities inside, outside, darkness, light, freedom, constraint, and so on, without any final goal or telos that could inform or justify their existence. The only telos that we can retrospectively surmise in their behavior is that of counterbalancing or imitating each other. The portrait that the title of the novel refers to, and that poses the biggest hermeneutic enigma to where it starts its reading, could thus be understood as a synonym for invention and performance, but also for replica and or self-projection. And I'm going to conclude. What kind of self do Isabel and the others strive to dismantle and reduce to a perennial replica with no final purpose? And here I will, I will yield to a probably a seductive simplification that, however, could, could prove <clears throat> sorry, fruitful in reading the novel as the Baroque fugue that American literature had been so long waiting for. Uh, European Baroque has often been thought of as in the position of the 16th century. As I remarked before, the equilibrium embodied in Descartes' thought or Italian Rinascimento is questioned and overthrown in the oblique and convoluted Baroque spirals. Americans, too, had their own Rinascimento to deal with, namely that American Renaissance that, according to Francis Otto Madison, represented the golden age of American letters in the middle 19th century. Previous criticism on the portrait of a lady has identified a continuity with the work of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the philosopher who provided the US culture with a system of thought roughly comparable to that of European idealism, envisaging in Isabel Archer the embodiment of the Emersonian uh, attempt to build up and shape one's own self. My contention here is quite the opposite. Since at the end of the century, American Renaissance still waited to be elaborated and interrogated, probably because in the meanwhile the Civil War had changed the agenda of US culture and politics, Isabel's task is that of questioning Emerson's self-reliance. The whole novel thus can be read as the attempt to blur the optimistic ideological and philosophical legacy of American Renaissance and Emersonian thought, suffusing it with its upset in chiaroscuros. Isabel, who as James ironically remarks in what reads as a tongue-in-cheek reference to Emerson, and never be able to understand Unitarianism, Emerson was a Unitarian, is pulled apart by opposing forces. On the one hand, she wants her life to be the sheer expression of herself, as her friend Henrietta, the Herbinger of American values and mythology, strongly recommends. Whatever life you lead, you must put your soul into it to make any sort of success of it. And from the moment you do that, it ceases to be romance. On the other, she's aware of some obscure force that prevents her prevents her from fulfilling her potential and keeps her tightly anchored to a compelling, much as undecipherable net of constraints and prohibitions to the point that she ends up marrying the worst of her suitors. You have too much conscience, warns Ralph, pointing out that because of this excess, Isabel is called to embody the transition between a legacy made of optimistic self-reliance and a present that still has to be defined. Whereas in uh, his 1847 self-reliance, Emerson had stated that my life is for itself and not for a spectacle, Isabel's story accounts for a radically different need and necessity. The only existence she can conceive for herself, in fact, finally amounts to the making sense of her own existence through numberless and meandering attempts. Before questioning any ethic or strategic and heuristic value of the idea of reliance, thus Isabel Archer addresses the very notion of self, which appears as divested of the ontological transparency that Emerson had enthusiastically provided it with. Like any portrait, also Isabel Archer's portrait follows the principle of imitation. Yet, we do not know where its original is, 
and as in a fugue, we do not either know when the process of self-unfolding, the only process that allows monads to emerge out and make sense of their darkness, will end. Thank you.